My name's Chris, and I repair my own audio equipment, and I also show you how to repair yours. So let's get started. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Well, I'm back with a video, and it's the ultimate troubleshooting guide. I've tried my best to put in just about everything I could think of. It's over an hour and a half long. That's pretty long, but it gives you a lot of information, I think, anyway, about how to troubleshoot your equipment. And I've been doing other things around the house here lately. I put in some outdoor lighting and just been doing some different different work around the house so I haven't been doing the videos like I had been doing them and so I just wanted to post this video for you guys and let you know that I am still around and that I'm gonna right now go have a beer The very first thing you want to do is take a look at the unit. Take a look at whatever damage you have that you can see on the outside first. Just pick it up, look at the back of it, look at the bottom of it, look at the top of it. Just look it over. Once you've done that, then remove the top cover. Take a look. Just see if you see anything obvious before you go ahead and power it up. Take a look at the bottom. Same thing. Turn the unit over. Take the bottom cover off. Take a look around. and make sure there isn't some reason that you shouldn't be powering this unit up. The last thing you want to do with an unknown piece of vintage audio equipment is to just power it up off the line voltage. You need to either have a Variac or you need a dim bulb tester or preferably you've got both. But a lot of these, you know, if you purchased it on eBay, you got it at a garage sale and you're talking to the person who had it and they tell you something about it and they say, oh yeah, I had it out in my garage, it was just working. Then you, you don't have to worry about this. This isn't a critical step. That's just for these units that somebody he just says I don't know you know it may have been 20 years since anybody's powered this up or I have no idea I found it in an attic those are the units where using a variac or a dim bulb tester is a good idea now we've gone through a couple steps and now it's time to power up the unit or maybe you already have powered up the unit either straight off the line voltage or using a variac or the dim bulb tester and what i think is a good idea is real quick to check the dc offset if you have an integrated amplifier an amplifier or a receiver i think it's a good idea to do a real quick dc offset test and just see where that's sitting at before you hook up a pair of speakers i know some of you you guys know how to check that and maybe some of you out there don't and if you click that link right up here at the top of the screen that'll take you to a video I did on how to check the DC offset of an amplifier now that the basics have been done, so you just need to hook it up and go ahead and see what's working and not working before you continue on. It's best to do this because down the road, you'll at least know that in the beginning, before you started working on this piece of equipment, what was working and what wasn't working. I have to stop myself for a minute and realize that not everybody approaches vintage audio equipment like I do. If I purchase vintage audio equipment, something Thing that's 30, 40, 50 years old or more, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to restore it. Not everybody does that. Not everybody believes in that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I started this video with the idea that, well, everybody's going to go in there and change out those electrolytic capacitors that I, that I always harp about. Everybody's going to go in there and get those troublesome transistors out and then the other issues that are in these pieces of equipment. But everybody doesn't approach it that way. Nobody's right or wrong. You've paid your money it's your equipment you can do whatever you want with it i just try to let you guys know from my experience what i do and what i think is best i just wanted to put that out there that you may get a piece of vintage equipment you may get it home you may go through these first three steps that we just did and you may say hey it's working good good enough for me nothing wrong with that at all for me i'm going to restore any old unit that i have as you guys know you've seen my videos you know my approach for me it's all about restoring 
ignoring them, bringing them back to 100%. But once again, I get it if you're not in that camp. If your equipment is in need of repair or restoration, you're going to need some basic tools. Most of y'all probably have what you need to work on vintage audio equipment, a variety of screwdrivers. You need a small set of needle nose pliers. You need a small wire cutter, something that's appropriate for the size of the wires that are in these units. Probably the most important thing I found that you need is a good Allen wrench set or a hex set. Both metric and SAE. And the last thing you want to do is strip one of those screws. While I'm mentioning these hex wrench sets, I think it's a good time just to show you a technique for getting them loose because this will be one of those things that sometimes will be difficult to get loose. Most of the time the case screws come out easily, but sometimes these hex screws do not. So let me just go ahead and show you a little bit about how to do that. The best way is again with this on its left side, right? This is a lot easier than this being flat down. We could move this guy down flat, but then what? You know, then we got to try to get under it. So this is like perfect for us. First way you want to try it, just to make it easier on you, right? is do it the long way. You don't want to force this. If you're having to bend this thing like crazy on the long side, again, I got this on the long side, then you need to turn the tool around to the short side because that'll give you a lot more leverage and you've got a lot less chance of stripping that screw. I know many of you guys know how to use a hex wrench but some of you out there don't and I just wanted to show you how to use this on a piece of vintage audio equipment because you don't want to strip those out and ask me how I know that. I've done it. These guys are little and, and you want to avoid that if you possibly can but the best way to avoid stripping those other than what I just showed you buy a good good hex wrench set. Now here's a tool that really comes in handy. And I say here's a tool because I have no idea what it's called. I have no idea where I got it. I have no idea exactly how long I've had it, but I've had it for a long time. And I usually use it with tape decks to pull springs into position. As you can see, it has these unusual hooks on the end and that's able to get a hold of these springs and many times pull them to where you need them. Matter of fact, I used it with my Sony TAE88B, the video I put up here on YouTube when I was repairing that because I had a spring come loose. Without this tool, I would not have been able to get the spring back where it needed to be in that Sony TAE88B. I just wouldn't have been able to. There'd been no way to do it without this tool. So if any of you guys out there know what this is and where you can get them, please put it down in the comments. So with some screwdrivers, a few pair of pliers, some cutters, a decent hex set and one oddball tool that I don't know what to call along with a few other tools that I'm sure most of you have around the house you'll be well on your way to having the tools needed to repair vintage audio equipment. Now that you've got the basic tools to get into the unit, now I'd like to talk to you about one of the problems that almost all of these vintage units have to some extent, and that's dirty controls. All of you guys have either had or heard of having a unit that sound comes and goes, the left channel's scratchy, then it comes back, you move this switch or you move the balance control, it comes, it goes, and almost always this has something to do with a dirty control somewhere in the unit. And and after all these years, these units that are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, they all need to have their controls cleaned. And I happen to use Deoxit. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about cleaning the controls. I just wanted to talk a minute about the products I use to clean the pots, the switches, and the various different moving parts in a piece of vintage audio equipment. Now I use Deoxit products. It's easy for you guys to go out there and do your own research. These aren't the only cleaning products available. I've used them for a lot of years. I've never had an issue. Some people will say some of these don't work or they don't work properly or whatever. I'm not a chemist. I'm not an expert on how one particular lubricant uh, may damage a piece of carbon or may damage a piece of plastic or what have you. But I just want to say from practical experience that these products have worked for me. Almost always you're going to have to do some disassembly to get to these controls. Some units are easier than others. Some it's possible to clean these controls without having to remove them from the chassis. Like this Kenwood KA5002. I didn't have to do anything. Those controls 
holes are right there. They're easy to get at. I can get that deoxit straw into them, no problem at all. Normally, you're going to have to remove the faceplate and you're going to have to loosen these controls to be able to get them in a position to clean them well. And not only clean them well, but from getting that deoxit all over the place. It's a wonderful product, I feel, but boy, it can make a mess. And you don't need much of it. You just need to get it where you need to get it. The one mistake most people make, and I made, as I said, I'm not a professional. I wasn't trained professionally. I'm a hobbyist, so I kind of, I learned the hard way, is I used to spray into these controls, move them two or three times, you know, like I was trying to take a squeak out of a out of a door hinge and say, well, I'm done. You've got them all apart, and you do that. You put them back together, you got the same problem. Or you've got a similar problem, and it's like, oh, no. And you've got to take it all back apart again. So I know it's going to sound crazy, but every control that you spray deoxid in, turn it 20, 30, 40, 50 times. You almost can't turn them too many times. And again, I know it sounds a little excessive, but it's going to take some time, but it's really necessary. And realize once you do this, you'll be able to put it back together and it'll be good again, most likely for decades. Earlier I mentioned for you guys to check DC offset in your amplifiers when you first get them. One thing I forgot about, maybe some of you guys don't have a multimeter. So you need a multimeter to work on this equipment. You don't need a $500 fluke multimeter, but you don't need a $3 one from your flea market either. I recommend that you go to Amazon, just do a search on digital multimeters, and there's several good ones for $20, $30, $40. So that's all you've got to spend but you really do need one of those and also for you guys that want to get into it a little deeper I just did a review of a Handtech 6022 BL PC oscilloscope and for under a hundred dollars you can get an oscilloscope you can get a signal generator that goes right on your iPhone and you can get the cable to make it all work so if you're interested in that check that out the hand tools I showed you earlier add to that the scope along with a multi meter and there's nothing else you need to diagnose any piece of vintage audio equipment. Receivers, pre-amplifiers, amplifiers, this is all you need. And you can see here you don't have to spend a ton of money to get yourself a little bit of a test bench. Now that you've got everything you need to diagnose a problem, now you've got to be able to repair it, and that requires some other tools. There's a few important ones, but probably the most important one is a good soldering iron. Once again, I'll say the same thing, just like I did about the multimeter. You don't have to go out and spend hundreds on a soldering iron, but don't go to the flea market and buy one for $3. Get on Amazon, do a search, look at the reviews, and you can probably pick up a good soldering iron iron for $20, $30. That'll work fine if you don't want to spend a lot of money on it. And now that's for soldering. But how about unsoldering? And that's where it gets a little more complicated as far as I'm concerned to give you a recommendation. Because as you guys know, I use that Hack OD soldering tool. I've got a couple of them actually. i got an older one and I've got a newer one. And I, I couldn't live without it. That's one of those tools I'm so glad I have. There are some other options that you can use for desoldering. One is solder wick. Secondly, you can use a solder sucker. I don't think either one are really viable for working on vintage audio equipment, unless you just have one or two components to mess with, because these would work better if everything was out on a table for you, was in a jig where you could get at it. You know, the problem is with either one, the solder wick, you've got to hold that solder wick onto the joint, onto the what you're unsoldering, and then with your other hand, hold the soldering iron on there. And that's all fine and well if it's all in front of you. But as you guys have seen with this vintage audio equipment, this stuff is at all different kinds of angles. And you don't really have room to do that. And the solder sucker is the same issue. It would be fine for one component, maybe. You'd figure out how to get it into some of these units to use it. But it really is not a, either one of those are not a viable option if you're going to really get serious in this hobby. Now, you don't have to buy a hack 
Echo desoldering tool. They're pretty expensive. They're around $300, give or take. There's some other ones. There's some off-brand ones that are cheaper. I've never tried them. If any of you guys have used any of these desoldering tools that are not as expensive as my Hacko, please put it down in the comments. And don't forget, you're going to need some solder. This is a solder I use, Kester. There are several different good solders out there. Again, do your own research. Decide how much you want to spend and just buy something halfway decent in the way of solder and all of your projects will come out well. If you're able to put a check mark on these first seven steps that I've gone over over the past few minutes, you'll be able to repair any vintage pre-amplifier, amplifier, or receiver. I'm going to talk about repairing tape decks and also tuners later on in the video. Both vintage tape decks and vintage tuners have the same issues that any piece of vintage electronics has. Bad capacitors, transistors, but also it adds a couple new elements. But we'll get to that later. Right now I want to bring up the safety of working around this equipment. First of all, it's something that's plugged into your mains. And here in the United States, it's 120 volts AC. It doesn't matter what it is. If you take your toaster apart and you're working on that and you've got it plugged in the wall, you can get shocked. It's not just vintage audio equipment, but you've got to have some basic understanding that this stuff can hurt you. And in vintage audio, as I showed earlier in a video about vacuum tube equipment, you can get hurt by this stuff and and tube based equipment you've got a better chance of getting hurt worse uh, people have been killed it's rare but it happens the worst shock I've ever gotten is a clothes dryer an electric clothes dryer a 220 volt AC electric clothes dryer I still remember that boy did that light me up Wow <laughs> I, I still remember it to today. I, I don't want to harp on it too much, but if, and, and I do understand that some people are not comfortable around electronics and that's fine you shouldn't be working on this stuff because you're gonna have to have it plugged into the wall at times. You don't have to have it always plugged in. You shouldn't have it plugged in when you don't but it, it, it's just part of the game. You take Once you take the cover off, you've exposed yourself to danger. So if you don't understand that, please don't work on it yourself and find a professional to work on the equipment for you. If you've decided that working on this stuff is for you, one of the main tasks you're going to have is just cleaning these units up. They're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and they're normally a mess. So I'd like to tell you about the process I use. Just get some warm water, some some dish soap and try it with that scrub them wipe them down with claws and just see what and just see how it looks it's just better to start with something like that than to start with something that's more abrasive a toothbrush a toothbrush works really well with the knobs the warm water and soap works well for the cases also for the face plate the knobs you know just try to clean it up the best you can and just see where you're at now saying that one item I've used for many years is mother's mag polish on aluminum face plates and I've never had an issue sometimes there's that crud nicotine whatever it is that's down in those aluminum face plates and warm water and dish soap just will not get it cleaned up and and so use a little bit of that mother's mag polish and it's always worked for me. Saying that, I've never had an issue with it affecting the stenciling on any aluminum faceplate. But you need to get in there and try a small spot first so you don't have some issue that I've never had with it. But it does really a wonderful job of getting down in those grooves and cleaning out what warm water and just soap won't. Now these are all good ideas for the external part of the unit, but internally, inside the unit, once you get the cover off, you can use a paintbrush to get a lot of the dirt and grime off. You can use compressed air, either in a can or if you have a, an air compressor, you can use that to clean it out. I recommend you take it outside and you do that work out there and you blow all that junk out into the air instead of into your home. The only thing I'd like to add, I've used Windex all also successfully but I never use that on the older pieces of equipment I have the ones that have the glass face plates the old 60s Macintosh the old 60s Morantz, the old 60s Fisher, Scott, etc. I've seen too many issues on the internet where people have gotten them wet with something, whether they used Windex or water or whatever, 
there goes the lettering. So I've cleaned them, but I've been extremely careful with them and I just clean them dry. And if I leave a few specks of dirt, so be it. I'm not taking the chance and having the lettering come off. I would be very, very careful with any face plate that was glass to get that wet. I know I've been talking about the cosmetics of this equipment and how you can damage the face plates with water or Windex, but it doesn't hurt to remind you guys that a lot of this older equipment, especially the 60s equipment that I'm talking about, being tube-based equipment is very dangerous to work on. I did a video on those dangers if you're interested. And not only are are they dangerous to work on they require a specialized piece of equipment that in today's world is difficult to come by and that's a tube tester if you're going to repair or restore vintage tube base equipment you must have one it's not an option you'll never get some of these pieces of vintage equipment running without it Many of these units have 10, 20, even up to 30 vacuum tubes. And almost always, everyone I've ever seen, who knows how long the vacuum tubes have been in there, you have several that are bad. And there is just no way to weed them out without a tube tester. You can't take them up to Radio Shack no more. There's not a tube tester there or up at your local pharmacy like you used to. I, I just wanted to throw that in there while I'm talking about the dangers of working on tubes is also you need a tube tester and that's not an inexpensive piece of equipment that you can just come upon. Let me add this before I forget about it. Get yourself some test leads, jumpers. You're going to use these all the time. Just get all different types. These are regular alligator clip leads. These are little mini grabbers. Whether you can see that or not, I don't know, but you can grab right onto a pin. They're all insulated. There's all different types of jumpers that you can get. Here's one that's a pin. You think, why would you use a pin? Well, you can stick it right down into a connector if you're having an issue, and you can measure on this other piece. There's both male, like this is, and there's females also. Get yourself a collection of jumper leads because you're going to need them. A few minutes ago, I said I was going to bring up tape decks, so I'd like to do that now. And you know, tape decks, for me, they're tough. They're tougher than receivers, and they're tougher than amplifiers and preamplifiers because you've got a whole nother side to them, and that's that mechanical side. Really, in a receiver, an amplifier, preamplifier, You've got a bunch of screws you got to get out of the way so you can get in there and work on them. And that's about the only thing mechanical you got in them. I have had to take apart switches and that kind of thing, as I showed in my Sony uh, TA88B preamplifier video. I do have to take apart some mechanical things in those units, but tape decks, you're going to get into something mechanical as soon as you start messing with them. E clips, C clips, springs, little washers, some that are nylon you can't even see them so if you don't even know they're there you can lose one and in a tape deck unlike a receiver case you lose a washer from your case on your receiver and you put a screw back in without the washer what's the big deal now it would bother me personally but a lot of people it wouldn't bother them well it's going to bother that tape deck whether it's a cassette or an open reel deck or an L cassette deck any kind of tape deck it's going to bother it you, you think ah one little nylon washer what can that do a lot so you've got a whole nother ball game involved with a tape deck. Add to that, to set up these analog tape decks, you really do need specialized equipment. You can get by with just changing the belts out, but you really don't know how it performs. But with saying that, I understand there's not technicians around like there used to be. A lot of you guys are on your own like I am. You just got to fix your own equipment. And is it worth going out getting specialized test tapes and test equipment just for your cassette deck or your open reel deck? Probably not. If I was in that position and I needed belts, I'd just get a belt kit and go for it. And if it sounded good, <laughs> that's, that's the way it would stay. And in today's world, we don't have the selection we used to have to get our equipment fixed. And I mentioned specialized equipment, so I'm going to touch on that, what I meant by that. And one of the main things that you need working on tape decks are test tapes. 
calibration tapes and these are quite expensive and you need several different test tapes for different brands for different speeds of decks like for an example an open reel deck you'd have a calibration tape for three and three quarter inches per second another one for seven and a half another one for 15 there's three test tapes these test tapes are expensive these are test tapes that run $150 each they're, they're big bucks and cassette decks you got the same issues you need certain calibration tapes for certain brands of cassette decks now some of them you can use in other decks you don't have to have a calibration tape for every single manufacturer and every single model of that manufacturer but you need quite a few different ones to cover everything so that's one of the main issues you have right up front is you're gonna have hundreds of dollars in calibration tapes but now there's only a few companies that make them and they have the specialized equipment to do that and the main reason behind all this you think well why do I need a special test tape just in a nutshell it's because you need a known starting point you can't make a test tape like with a tone from one of your recorders and then use that as the test tape for all your other machines you've got to have highly precise recorders that are made to do this to make these calibration tapes as i was putting this video together i was also working on another video that may help out many of you to be able to calibrate test and repair it's a software simulation it's called the nakamichi audio analyzer simulator and i'm going to show you some of that video right now because I think that that software for 99% of you will allow you to work on cassette decks, work on open reel decks, any type of analog tape deck. Can a Nakamichi T100 auto analyzer, one of the most sought after bench tools for testing analog tape decks, be replaced by a piece of inexpensive software? You're about to find out. So that's the opening for my Nakamichi T100 simulation software video. I'm not going to show you the entire video here. If you're interested in it, you can go and take a look at it. But I do want to highlight part of the video. This is a real viable option for you guys to have a tool that can help you to maintain and repair any type of analog tape deck. So it's very similar to what I've shown you guys before with my Sound Technology ST50. 1510A, which is a standalone test unit for tape decks that was state-of-the-art 40 years ago. But there was nothing available like this 40 years ago. But within this scope section, you're able to check frequency response sweeps, frequency response for pink noise, frequency response for white noise, spectrum you've got an oscilloscope function it'll do a, a lot of different stuff so this software has a lot of different options and the good thing about it is that it has real good documentation there's a lot in there it tells you how to connect the unit it tells you how to calibrate the unit it tells you how to use all the different features of the unit there's a little bit of a learning curve here it'll do quite a bit you can just use your mouse to control the knobs just like if you're using your your fingers on a real T100 and you can set it to the different functions. I showed you with the uh, sweeps how the scope works and everything. It has an oscilloscope built into it. I didn't play with that much so I, I don't want to spend a ton of time with this and take it feature for feature. If you're interested purchase it. Try it. It's 25 bucks. Software like this T100 simulator gives you options that you just didn't have 40-50 years ago. This along with the Handtech PC oscilloscope I showed you earlier, for a couple hundred dollars, you can have something that can troubleshoot vintage audio, and you can pretty much do anything you need to do. You just got to decide, is it worth it to you to do that? Would you rather have an old oscilloscope or an old piece of test equipment that can help you with your tape deck or not? So as you can see, if you're working on tape decks, there's a little bit more to them, along with you need a little bit more in the line of certain test equipment to be able to work on them also. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tuner repair and first of all many times the tuners work in these pieces of equipment and but they may not work exactly right just like the rest of the unit. Sometimes you've got these different issues and many times these tuners need an alignment and the problem with that is you need quite a bit of specialized equipment to do the alignment correctly and the main piece of equipment you need is an FM generator like a sound technology 
ST-1000A, which was a state-of-the-art piece of a bench equipment back 40, 50 years ago. You need a Maldi meter, an oscilloscope, you need a distortion meter. Anyway, you need a whole bunch of stuff to really do a decent job if you're going to try to align an FM tuner. Now, some things you can fix in the FM section of a receiver or in a, in a tuner, but they usually involve distortion in one channel and not the other, or no audio in one channel and not the other, and usually that's a transistor. So you can do some repair on your tuners. You just don't want to start turning those coils without the proper test equipment. We've gone over quite a bit already. You know, starting from when you obtain a unit, how you should just look it over and getting to the point to where you can power it up and the basic tools that you need to work on this equipment and even more advanced tools to work on certain pieces of equipment. But now, because we've got everything we need to work on the equipment or to restore the equipment, but what don't we have? We have no documentation on the equipment and you must get that before you start any project, whether it's a repair or a restoration. HiFiEngine.com is the resource to get owner's manuals, service manuals, old brochures, just about any type of documentation that you would need to either restore or repair vintage audio equipment. All you've got to do is go to HiFiEngine.com, open up a user account, and you're ready to download. There's no charge. And from my experience, they have 99% of the documentation I've ever needed for any piece of vintage audio equipment. The most important document is that service manual for whatever piece of equipment you're working on. Without a service manual, you're not going to have a chance to be able to repair or restore this equipment. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're inexperienced or you're experienced. You need the service manual. But not only the service manuals are on there, as I indicated. There's the original owner's manuals are on there. And that's really nice to have because many of us don't have the original manuals with our equipment. They've gotten thrown away way over the years and they're just not there. And also I mentioned the brochures. These are the same brochures that back in the day when I went to my local stereo shop and I'm there looking around, I walk out of the store. If I don't purchase anything, I walk out of the store at least with some brochures and they try to talk me into coming back and buying the stuff. So as I said, Hi-Fi Engine's a great resource for anybody who's into vintage audio. I want to tell you about one more resource if you're interested interested in the old vintage audio equipment, especially the old reviews. Now the next one is World Radio History. There's so much stuff in here, not just about vintage audio, but electronics in general. Google World Radio History and you'll find it. Now that you know where to get documentation for your vintage audio equipment, let me tell you where to get parts for your vintage audio equipment. I can't tell you how many times that I'm contacted from folks who say their technician says you can't get parts for these anymore. For the most part, that's just not true. The technician just doesn't want to do the work it's going to take to find them, is what it amounts to. Because the day's long gone when you can look in the service manual and call Sansui or Pioneer or whoever and just order the part out of the service manual. You're not going to be able to do that. You have to do the research yourself and you have to find the components yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and show you where I feel are the best places to get parts for your vintage audio equipment. So let's get started. Mauser Electronics and DigiKey Electronics are where I feel you should buy most of your parts from. They'll have 95% of the components that you need to keep your vintage audio equipment running or to restore your vintage audio equipment. Now things like cosmetic pieces, let's say you're missing a volume control, on your receiver. You're not finding it here. You're going to have to go to eBay to get something like that. Transistors, capacitors, resistors, those type of components. A lot of people just think they're going to go to these sites and just find their parts. It's, it's going to take you some time. And it's really not that difficult to find the parts, but there's a lot of choices. And you've got to know which ones to use, and that's the difficult part. So I would suggest that you go to some of these audio forums on the internet or just do a general search on Google like Pioneer SX 1980 Restoration or something like that and you'll find some long articles on what people have done, what parts they've used, etc. and that'll help you, help you find what you need. 
From time to time, I'll get asked for my build list for a project. I work on so many different units that I just keep a stock of parts. And normally, the only thing I won't have are those filter capacitors. Anyway, I don't have a bunch of those sitting around. But the rest of the components, I order in quantities of 10, 25, maybe even 100 at a time. You can purchase these quite a bit cheaper if you buy them in bulk from both Mauser and DigiKey. And it's just so convenient to just start a project and have all the parts available. You guys that follow my videos know why I need all these parts because I go in and I restore every old piece of equipment that I have. I'm a firm believer in getting those old electrolytic capacitors out, getting those other known semiconductors out of there that are known to be bad through the years. There's several transistors that are bad. If you find them, you gotta get rid of them or they're gonna cause you trouble. There's a few diodes, but the main thing is those electrolytic capacitors they're all going to fail and it's not me saying that it's the manufacturers of those capacitors that say that and I just ask you all again to please do your research in today's world there's really no excuse for you not knowing the truth about electrolytic capacitors just google electrolytic capacitor lifespan and start reading and you'll find all the manufacturers websites talking about it you'll find engineers talking about it every single electrolytic capacitor capacitor no matter its quality it's going to fail someday you're probably thinking well yeah they're all going to fail everything's going to fail eventually but if you guys don't want to do the research i understand i've done a little bit of it i'm no expert as you guys can tell i'm not real bright and i'm a hobbyist who works on vintage audio equipment but i can tell you a little bit about them and the reason that they fail is because of a slow evaporation of the electrolyte that's in these capacitors two main issues cause that electrolyte to start to evaporate and that's a lot of time and that's a lot of heat there it is in a nutshell if you've got an electrolytic capacitor that's been in a very hot environment for a very long time you've got a better chance of it failing but generally and again to just come down to a, a conclusion after about 20 years in a normal environment you can expect your electrolytic capacitor to operate properly within its specifications and not fail on you. Maybe you'll get really lucky and, and go 30 or 40. It certainly can happen depending on the capacitor. But keep in mind, every failure is not an explosion. Every failure is not my receiver won't power up. Many times these fail slowly over time. They don't fail spectacularly. And so you may believe that your piece of vintage audio equipment's working great. If it's 30, 40, 50 years old and hasn't had its electrolytic capacitors changed out it's very unlikely it's operating like it did when it was new but as I mentioned earlier this is just something you all have got to decide on your own I restore my equipment you may not want to do it to yours am I right are you wrong no you do what you want to do with your equipment I do what I want to do with my equipment now let's move on from the restoration side of it and let's get into a little bit of troubleshooting if you have an issue with your vintage audio equipment the approach I'm going to take is a general troubleshooting guide for vintage audio I think many of you out there are like I am it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of an electronics background or not when you're working on vintage audio equipment first time you take a look at it it's kind of daunting where do you start where do you look what do you do so I think it's best for me to talk in general so I'm gonna take kind of a simplified approach a common sense approach to troubleshooting vintage audio equipment assuming that you follow the instructions earlier in this video and now you've got a unit up on the test bench and you've tried the different features and the left channel and the right channel and you've tried different things and assuming you've now got an issue one of the biggest causes of issues in vintage audio equipment these controls have gotten corrosion in them over the years that can just cause a million different issues maybe your sound comes and goes maybe it goes and won't come back the one thing in common though if it's dirty controls is you just start hitting the buttons on the 
face of the unit. You just start moving the volume control up and down. Does it sound scratchy? Does the sound come and go? The balance control the same way. And not just those controls. It may be your high filter. It may be your low filter. It may be a bass control. You pretty much got to just start turning them if they're knobs or start pushing them if they're buttons. And if in any way the sound changes, whether it goes away or comes back or kind of comes back or kind of goes away, almost for sure the controls need to be cleaned. Now the difficulty with that is to clean them properly with deoxit or some other product if you prefer is many times you've got to disassemble these units to some point to be able to clean these controls properly. The number one common sense thing, if you've got an issue, and you can move the controls and it changes. Then you've got dirty controls and you need to get in there and you need to clean them with a deoxid or some other product of your choice. There's many different ones. If cleaning the controls fixed you up and everything seems to be working, then you can go ahead and restore the unit if you're gonna do that. If you're not gonna get in there and restore it, just button her back up and enjoy the music with her. But if cleaning the controls didn't fix your issue, now what? And that's where it becomes more complicated and I think I'll talk about receivers. I say that because they really comprise three of the main components that many of you guys own. Receiver consists of a preamp, a power amp, and a tuner. So it can kind of kill three birds with one stone here and many times problems are in one channel or the other. Maybe your left channel's working, your right isn't. Maybe there's distortion in one channel in the or the other. So there's a way you can go about to break this down and troubleshoot it and a receiver would be the best way for me to explain it because you've got three separate boxes in one. You've got the tuner, the preamp, and the power amp. So let's assume you've got an issue with one channel or another. Here's what I would do. I'll be using a Pioneer SX 1250 as an example but as I indicated this will work for any piece of equipment and I know some of you guys already know how to do this but some of you don't and so I'm going to go through it real quick and try to break this down in a simple manner so when you go to work on your piece of equipment it doesn't seem so daunting so when you open it up you think well geez I can kind of figure out here where I'm gonna go so the first thing you want to do is to determine if the issue that you're having is with every input meaning if you select the FM tuner for an example do you still have that same issue if you hook a CD player up to the auxiliary port do you ha still have that same issue do you still have that same issue with a turntable? Once you find that out, whether it's all inputs or maybe just one input, and once you get that figured out, you can see how this is going to help you to repair the unit. Because a large part of the unit, you're not even going to have to look at it because you know the issue that you have is in a particular section or maybe a couple sections. But you keep narrowing it down that way and pretty soon it becomes manageable and you're able to work on this equipment and get it repaired. So let's say after doing your troubleshooting, you determine that the issue is just in your FM section. That means you can eliminate most of this receiver. And that right there is going to make it so much easier to find your problem because now you know it's in the tuner section. Now you're going to have to get some more detail other than this block diagram that I'm showing you of a Pioneer SX 1250 because now you know it's in the tuner section. But you're going to need the schematic to be able to troubleshoot this issue down to a component level and find that bad transistor or that bad capacitor or whatever's causing this issue. And the only way to do that is with the schematic itself. Now, you could have a power supply issue. I should have not taken the power supply out totally because many times they run power up to the FM sections of these receivers with a, a voltage that only the tuner uses. So it could be a voltage problem from the power supply, but most likely a component that's in the FM section of this receiver. And keep in mind, equipment that was built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, most of the time, each of these sections are going to be on separate assemblies. Not always, but many times they are. And usually you're going to find the FM section of a receiver on its own assembly. There's only one assembly in that receiver that has anything to do with the FM working properly other than the power supply 
supply that needs to supply voltage to it. All of these illustrations I'm showing you are in the Pioneer SX1250 service manual. They give you a lot of information in those service manuals and if you just think about what you're doing it's not as complicated as it seems when you first open one of these beasts up. All right that's a good example showing you how one particular section of a receiver you can troubleshoot it down to one section and you can work on it from there. There's one assembly in this Pioneer SX1250, the equalizer amplifier in this particular receiver. Different manufacturers have different names for it, but you kind of think, well, what's an equalizer amplifier? Just think of your vinyl albums. It has to do with that. Let me explain a little bit about why it is called an equalizer amplifier. Really what this is, it's your phono board. So you think to yourself, well, why, why not? Why don't you call it a phono board? Because it really is an equalizer. It does has two purposes. One is to amplify those very small electrical signals that come out of your stylus. You put the cartridge down your record, you just barely hear it. Well, that's not enough for this SX1250 to work with. That has to be amplified. So this board amplifies those very low signals into something usable for the uh, SX1250. The reason they call this an equalizer is there's something called an RIAA curve and it was a process that was created for record and playback. I won't go into this very much but I just want to tell you that when a record is cut or created it is de-emphasized in the lower frequencies and overemphasized in the higher frequencies. This was done to allow longer playback of a vinyl record but if you de-emphasize something and overemphasize something, what do you have to do? You've got to equalize it. And that's what this board does. So I wanted to cover that assembly just to show you another one of how you want to break down whatever type of issue you have with your receiver. This equalizer amplifier has to do with your turntable. So if you've got an issue with just your turntable, it's almost for sure something to do with this board. Once again, it could have something to do with the power supply, but most likely it's right on this one assembly or whatever the issue is that you're having with your turntable. And keep in mind also, both the left and right channels are on these assemblies, which can help you troubleshoot a problem when you only have an issue in one channel or the other. You can use the good channel to compare signals to the bad channel. So we've looked at a couple different individual assemblies, the phono section of this receiver and also the tuner section of this receiver, assuming that we've got a problem with just one specific input. But now let's assume this receiver has an issue with every input, meaning that you tried the FM and you had an issue with one of your channels. Then you tried the phono. You've got the same problem. So that means you've got the problem in more than one assembly. That means we've got to look somewhere else. We've got to look somewhere where all of this comes together in the receiver. And once again, I'm talking about a Pioneer SX1250, but I'm trying to generalize this in a way that this will fit any receiver or any preamplifier or any amplifier from this era from the 60s, 70s, 80s. So whether you've got a Pioneer, a Sansui, a Macintosh, you name it, over about a 20 year period this is the way these pieces of equipment were built. So I just want to make that a, a point that this isn't a troubleshooting on just an SX1250 but really on about 20 years of audio gear. Now that you found out there's a multiple inputs with the same issue. What could be causing that? Well, now you spread out a little bit more because it could be the pre-amplifier section or it could be the power amplifier section. And again, I'm not going to leave out that power supply because it could be the power supply also. What I'm trying to show you guys is a process that'll make working on this equipment easier. And it doesn't matter if you have no experience or you've been doing this your whole life. This is how 
you're going to do it. You may do it a lot quicker if you've worked on these a little bit than if this is your first one. First thing you want to do is narrow down an issue as much as you can before you start working on it. All the illustrations and schematics that you're seeing are in the service manual. The point I want to make is the service manuals contain a lot of information because this was way pre the internet. So the corporations like Pioneer who made this SX1250 gave the service centers, gave the shops that were selling their equipment as much documentation as they could because they didn't want to get barraged with phone calls to California or New York. They've got a problem. They don't know what to do. So the service manuals are usually pretty informative and they even, even in this SX1250's case, they give you a bunch of circuit descriptions because they're trying to get the technician, whoever that may be, there were thousands of them back in the day, and all different levels of skill. They gave you a ton of documentation so that you could take care of yourself when you had an issue. There's a lot of documentation on the old audio equipment. Always do a Google search for your piece of equipment, and most of the time you can find out a lot about it. And by finding out more about your piece of equipment, that's going to allow you to fix it easier. Just makes sense. And in my case, I find this stuff interesting. How much of this do I understand? To be honest, not a whole lot of it. But you read it over and you read it over again and then you look at another circuit and then another circuit and over time it starts making a little bit more sense to you. And as I said, in this era of equipment, this Pioneer works in a very similar manner to any other manufacturer of the time. So I just wanted to share that information with you because the service manual has some critical items like that schematic that you've got to have, but also many of them have information like this SX1250 does that's both informative but also interesting, and it gives you a better feel for the piece of equipment that you're working on. All right, now it's time to get back to where I was. That is that we've got a problem with one channel or another, but it's for multiple inputs. So let's see how to approach that. As I mentioned, when you have multiple inputs that are causing the same issue, your pre amplifier, the power amplifier, and the power supply sections of a receiver are the most suspect. In this SX1250, they call the preamp the control section. And the reason they do this in this block diagram is because in this block diagram, they're showing several different assemblies that are in this SX1250. See that control section as the preamp. To be able to troubleshoot any issue in vintage audio equipment, it helps so much to know how these units are put together. So I'm going to go through the control section, or as I mentioned, the preamplifier, and I'm going to show you each individual assembly within that preamplifier, because the more you understand what they're showing you here, the easier it's going to be for you to fix your piece of equipment. As I mentioned, from this era, all the units are built in a similar manner, so you don't have to have a Pioneer SX1250 for this to be valid information. And the more you know about how it's built, the easier it's going to be for you to pinpoint what area that you're having an issue with. So let me go through a little bit about the various assemblies in the pre-amplifier of the SX1250. Now I'll move to the flat amplifier, the AWG042, and the control amplifier, the AWG041. The flat amplifier and the tone control amplifier assemblies sit at the bottom of the SX1250. The tone control amplifier is at the left of the chassis toward the bottom. You have your bass controls and you have your on off switch for your tone controls and then you have your treble adjustments. Then you move over into the flat amplifier which has your tape monitor circuits, the balance control, uh, the loudness button, uh, your volume control is also on that assembly. So it's the bottom section of the SX1250. There's really two assemblies that it consists of. And again, I'm talking about the SX1250, but your piece of equipment is going to be similar to this. And once you guys figure out how to relate the schematic to the unit that you have, this will make it much simpler to troubleshoot any issues. We've got one more assembly that's part of the control section or the preamp, and that's that's the low and high filter assembly. This assembly sits just over the control amplifier and the filter 
amplifier that we just went through. And on that level, along with this filter amplifier, is a speaker switch assembly and the function switch assembly. And they're three separate boards that sit just under the radio dial of the SX1250. Let me point out where these switches are on the block diagram. And this will help you also to troubleshoot an issue. There's a key up in the top right hand corner and it says switches and it has the different switch designations. And these different switch numbers correspond to various functions. If you take a look at like S11 through S15, AM, FM, Phono 1, Phono 2, and Auxiliary. And then it's got S16 through S25 and that's your tape monitors, etc, etc. Down the line, the speaker switches, which are S26 through 28. With an issue like we're talking about, having a problem with one channel or another, it's a good time to go into a little bit more detail about these guys. All three of these assemblies consist of push button switches, which in large part the cause of intermittent issues in vintage stereo equipment. I'll use deoxit to clean each of them. Where you spray is up toward the front of the switch near the spring. And if you take a look at the switch itself, if you get the spray in there correctly, you can see a small little point in the center of the switch and the deoxit spray will come right out of those switches if you get it in there correctly. You've got to exercise each of these switches 30, 40, 50 times. I know it always sounds ridiculous, but the first time you take one of these apart and you've still got an intermittent issue, you'll wish you've done it you'd done it 30 or 40 or 50 times when you're ripping it back apart again these are the leading cause of those intermittent issues just all kinds of flaky things and you start pushing the buttons and it works for a while and then you try it the next time and you're pushing some other button to get it to work correctly this isn't going to be your problem if you're blowing fuses or something more major but if you have an intermittent issue there's a very good chance it has some Thing to do with these push button switches. Using deoxit on these push button switches is another example of how you can repair vintage audio equipment with no test equipment. Now the only caveat with that, if you saw in these pictures, you've got to almost always take these assemblies out of the chassis. You just cannot get to them without doing that. You cannot get that spray up into that switch. But with that being said, you don't need a multimeter, you don't need a scope, you don't need any skills other than the mechanical skill to be able to get these assemblies out, get them sprayed with the deoxid, exercise those controls 20, 30, 40, 50 times, and then getting it back together. But if you've got an intermittent problem, there's a good chance it's one of these push button switches. And not just these, it can be your balance control, it can be your volume control, it could be the toggle switches. If you've got trouble with any of your controls, you can expect the other ones that you're not having trouble with you're probably soon going to have an issue with them. So really any of these pieces of old vintage gear that are 40, 50 years old, they really need to have all of their various control surfaces cleaned. So you can see the preamp section has a lot of different components that can be causing issues. Not just the transistors and those old electrolytic capacitors that go bad, but all of these switches. So another assembly that can cause you issues is the power amplifier. And and let me show you a little bit about that. First off, as you can see, there's none of those switches that are directly connected to this power amplifier. With the cover off the SX1250, you can see the two power amplifier assemblies. One's the left channel and the other one's the right channel. And here, notice that there's a power in RCA connector that goes into the left channel and into the right channel of the power amplifier assemblies. And let me also mention at the same time, I didn't before, but the pre-amplifier section has pre-out RCA connectors. And in this particular model, there's two jumpers that are in the back of the SX1250 that you're able to access, turn it around with the RCA jacks are, and you'll see these metal jumpers, the jumper between the pre-out and the power in. And separating the preamp from the power amp's a great troubleshooting tool also. If you have another amplifier, you can hook it to the control section 
connection or pre-amplifier. If you have another pre-amplifier, you can hook it to the power amplifier. Some have a switch in the back that you can disconnect the preamp from the power amp and do the same thing. But even if you don't have a preamp or a power amp, what you can do is take an RCA cable and plug the left channel into the right channel of the power amp. And then take another RCA cable and take the output from the right channel of the preamp and put it into the left channel of the power amp. What I'm trying to do here, as I mentioned before, is to get you thinking in a way to get it narrowed down, whatever your issue is. Fortunately, with two-channel vintage audio equipment, you can do some of that. And you can eliminate a lot of circuitry by just narrowing down your issue. And then you can focus on that part of the unit and fix your problem easier. Now I think you guys get my drift here. I'm just trying to go through the things that I've ran into over the years and that's why I went through these controls quite a bit. You can have an issue one time and then not have the issue. You need a can of deoxit and you need some screwdrivers to be able to get these units apart to uh, work on it. But now let's assume that that's not the problem you've got a real issue. There's something wrong with one channel or the other. And now you are going to need some sort of diagnostic tools. A multimeter is a must, but there's only so much you can do with a multimeter. Of course, you can test voltages with it. You can see if a component is shorted or open. But really, at this point, when you've got an issue with one channel or the other, first of all, you've got the best expert ever right there with you and that's the good channel. So even if you don't understand how to read a schematic, you can look at the good channel and see what signal you have at a certain point and follow it along. Now the problem's gonna be, well, how do you follow the signal along? That's where you're gonna need a signal generator, you're gonna need an oscilloscope. There's no way to get around it. You don't have to have anything fancy, special, expensive to work on vintage audio equipment as far as an oscilloscope goes. You can have any scope, really, that's been built in the last 50, 60 years will work fine for vintage audio equipment, tracing out a sine wave through the unit. You don't need anything special at all. Signal generator, you need that. And recently I did a video on a signal generator that I downloaded onto my iPhone. Worked great. It'd be great for troubleshooting any type of vintage audio. Along with that, I tested a PC oscilloscope. I purchased that. I installed it onto my uh, computer and that worked fine too. So for under a hundred bucks, you can get a little test bench going, including even a digital multimeter. You don't have to get a high-end fluke multimeter. You can get one off of Amazon for 25 bucks, get a PC oscilloscope for 70 bucks, get the app for five bucks, and anyway, 100 bucks, you're ready to go. You've got everything you need to troubleshoot and repair vintage audio equipment. Now, this is the easy part, frankly. The repair of them is more difficult, and we're talking about having a problem with one channel or another and maybe you don't have a lot of experience to know what you're expecting at certain points on the schematic. And as I mentioned, the best way is to follow along that good channel. When you see a signal that's different from the bad channel, you can go back and see where that changes. You keep trying to narrow that down. All of these pieces of equipment, as I said, they were similar in their day, but there are some differences the way they were assembled. And some are easier to work on in others. A lot like cars. Some are easy to do certain repairs. Some are very difficult to do certain repairs. And the same thing goes with vintage audio equipment. Some of the assemblies are easy to get to. Some are easier than others. And it just depends on the unit. They were all built a little bit differently. And there's really no easy way for me to explain about the differences other than you getting experience working on it. But I mentioned earlier about all those jumper leads. You're going to need those. And another thing, you've got to be careful in these units, not just for your own safety, but for the units. You're probably going to learn the hard way, like I did. You're, you're going to try to put a jumper on, or you're going to try to put a test lead on somewhere with the power power on and you're going to short something out. I've shorted out several things. I'm a bit more careful nowadays, but I'm not immune to making mistakes even today. I make them and you're going to make them. 
Uh, but over time, you learn uh, safety is probably the best course, both for you and the equipment. So when you're hooking on a test lead or you're reaching in the unit, just turn it off and do what you're going to do. Get your connections made, then turn it back on and, and take your measurements. And then if you need to move the leads, turn it off. But the tendency is what? You want to just move that lead. And sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. But a lot of times these units are pretty crowded and it's tough to get your hands where you need them and when the power's off you don't have to worry about shorting out that transistor or that capacitor and then having even more problems than what you're trying to fix. As I said, vintage audio equipment isn't always easy to fix, but if you can narrow it down to a section, you may even get lucky and see the problem. I've had that on several pieces of equipment that I narrow down the issue like I showed you over the last few minutes, trying to narrow it down to a section, and so I looked and I saw components that were blown right off the board, capacitors that were leaking, goo down in the bottom of the chassis from where a capacitor had started leaking, etc. And by working it down to a section, you could actually see the problem. Now that's usually not the case. Usually you don't get that lucky. And you're pulling out that multimeter, that scope, and that signal generator. But always take a look at the assemblies before you start working on it, and you might get lucky. So in conclusion, when you're troubleshooting an issue with one channel, narrow it down to as small of area as you can. Many times in vintage audio equipment, you can narrow it down to one assembly. At that point, put a thousand hertz sine wave into the unit and look at it through both channels. Almost always, you're going to be able to see a difference between those two channels, no matter what your issue is. Whether you have no audio, low audio, distorted audio, that sine wave is going to look different on the good channel compared to the bad channel. And you may not be able to narrow it down to one component, but you will be able to narrow down whatever issue you're having into a much smaller area, and then you've got a really good chance of being able to fix whatever the issue is. I've shown you in the last few minutes about how to troubleshoot an issue if you have one bad channel and you've got one good one. Many times you'll run into an issue with these units where you don't have any audio whatsoever. They'll power up or appear to power up. You'll hit the power button and the display will light up, but you'll have no audio. And many of these units from the 60s, 70s, and 80s have a protection circuit. And this protection circuit usually involves one or more relays that protect your speakers from excessive DC. DC voltage and many of them also have a protection circuit that will protect the power amplifier from drawing too much current. So if you've got an issue with your unit powering up, but you've got no audio, I'm going to show you how to approach something like that if you've got that type of issue. Going over the block diagram the last few minutes with you, this SX1250, the only assembly I haven't gone over is the protection circuit. Because the issues we were talking about before, the unit had powered up, whether we we had an issue with our phono section, our FM section, our power amplifier, our preamp, whatever it was, if those are operating at all, it's not your protection circuit. Because what will happen is you'll get no audio whatsoever that your protection circuit is either protecting you from, or sometimes the protection circuit itself has a defect that won't allow the amplifier or receiver to power up. Again, I really shouldn't say power up. It's more along the lines that you just don't have any audio. You may have lights but you don't have any audio. Let me also tell you you'll have no audio output from either channel even if there's a problem with only one channel. The way these protection circuits work is if you have an issue with your left channel or your right channel the relays are not going to operate and you're going to have no audio whatsoever. As I mentioned earlier a couple times these techniques I'm showing you will work for any piece of audio equipment that you may have. So I'm going to show you now a video I did on a Marantz 2245 that had the exact issue that I'm talking about right now, where it would power up, but that protection relay in it would not engage, and you'd get no audio. And again, I'll mention, like I have a couple times, that these units were all designed in a similar manner. Whether it's this Pioneer or this Marantz I'm going to show you, 
or whether it's a Sansui or some other brand. I'm going to show you a video I did quite some time ago, a pretty early one, of me troubleshooting a Marantz 2245 receiver that has no audio, but it appears to power up okay. Today I'm going to show you how to diagnose an issue with a vintage receiver or amplifier when you have no audio out from either channel and your speaker relay will not engage. Okay, I'm going to power up uh, this brand's 2245. Let's see what uh, happens here. Okay, waiting for that speaker relay to click and we hear nothing. Um, the front is lit up. I'm looking at it here. The FM's working, or appears to be, but there is no output because the speaker relay hasn't engaged. So, um, usually that's one of three things uh, in these units. It could be the protection board itself, this guy up here, or it could be one of the amplifier uh, assemblies, either the left or the right channel, and we're gonna narrow that down now. I'm going to see what each of these amplifier, each of these amplifier assemblies, the DC offset from them, reading this here is bypassing the, uh, the speaker relay. So if I read them right now, the speaker relay, I know it isn't working because I did not hear that distinctive click. So if I measure DC offset right now out at the speaker terminals, it just isn't going to give me any information because there's nothing there. It's totally just open right now. So what I need to find out is, is this problem with the protection board itself? Or is it one of the amplifier sections? So I'm going to measure from the right and the left channel uh, the DC offset. And let's see what we've got. So here's the right channel. And you got to be careful in here. I've got my camera behind me. I'm kind of in a position I'm not usually in. So I've got to be ultra careful because there are plenty of places to short things together here. I don't care how much experience you've got, you got to be extremely careful around any of these assemblies. And for you guys that don't have any experience, well, you know, you're going to get some and then you're going to make mistakes from time to time. I'm going to try not to make a mistake right now. So. I'm going to get my meter here ready. Let's see if I can get that turned on. I don't know if I can show you that at the same time. Uh, <laughs> well, if I, it doesn't look like it does. Well, maybe I can, or maybe you're going to have to believe me what I read. Uh, well, maybe I, this is going to be interesting. Let me put it there. And I'm going to read the right channel. Let's see if I can uh, do this without blowing the thing up even worse. Uh, it's about 20 millivolts. That's good. I mean, nothing wrong with that. That's not the reason why this thing, uh, why the speaker relay won't engage. So let's go to the other channel, which is the left channel. See again if I don't cause some kind of problem. Uh, <laughs> well, there's your problem. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can see that. Uh, that's not 36 millivolts, that's 36.4 volts. Will this blow up your speakers? Yes, it will. So there's the problem. So we can assume from this then, let me get the probe and my uh, meter out of here for something bad happens. Um, we can assume from that that probably the protection board's good, right? I mean, it could have a problem too after we fix whatever the other problem is. But the problem is with that uh, left channel having 36 uh, and a half volts. <laughs> on it. So let's try to figure that out. Okay, I've got the amplifier module laying out on its side. I'm going to look right here, right off. This is the same lead. You can't see it now. I showed it um, earlier that goes over to this. Um, let's see if I show you some light here. See in there. But this protection module where the speaker relay is. We were looking on that other side where there was 36 volts. And I'm just going to verify that here. I, I removed the uh, amplifier assembly, got it out in a position where I think I can work on it here anyway. Got, I'm going to try to stick my uh, probe in here, hold the camera. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's the 36 volts we saw. 
So it's right there on that yellow lead, that same yellow lead we saw up on the uh, protection circuit. So uh, let's see what we can do to find out what's causing that. A lot of issues with all old stereo equipment, especially on these areas that do get warm, are solder joint issues. So I wanted to just eyeball it. I usually do anyway, but in this case, I'm definitely going to because we got a problem and just see if I can see anything. Maybe some of these solder joints are cracking and uh, maybe it'll be that simple of a fix. Once again, you've got to be extremely careful, you know, when you have an assembly like this. I've got the heat sink uh, off of this. You can see I've wrapped a little bit of electrical tape around the um, sockets for the output transistors just so hopefully I don't short something together. But you can see when you've got something like this there's a lot of possible scenarios that can happen that won't turn out good for uh, the unit. What I found, I'm going to try to I don't know if I can show you this or not, but remember we had that 36 volts? But what I found is when I tap this board, um, the DC offset would go back, would go normal, would back to 36 volts, back to normal. So that told me I had something intermittent. Probably, probably was not a component, probably. <laughs> um, but we shall have to see. It's probably more like a solder, a solder joint, right? Because it's coming and going. But it'll come and go if I hit up in this section here. Uh, who knows where it is? You know, what you're really doing, sending a vibration down to here, who knows. But anyway, now I'm going to, seeing that I don't think I have a component issue, I mean, I still could, could have a cracked resistor, or who knows, cracked a leg on a transistor, I don't know. But probably this is something to do with a solder joint. So I'm going to take a look at the bottom now. I really didn't, you can see I've got the receiver in a different uh, position now, so I can see the back of this uh, assembly. I didn't really see anything, um, but I ended up just taking my iron and over on that one side of the board where I was having issues, so about a third of the board, I just hit all the leads. I just uh, flowed solder into those leads, and now um, I'm going to turn it back over and uh, see if that helped us at all. You know, sometimes this is this is what needs to be done. These solder joints, just after years, especially on like this assembly, that gets pretty warm. Um, they just get to the point where they start to fail. Heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. And again, we're talking 40 plus years. So this type of thing happens uh, certainly fairly often. So I'm gonna turn it back over now. After flowing those solder points, uh, the board looked nice and solid. Uh, the DC offset was just a few millivolts like it should be. I uh, beat it around a little bit uh, just to make sure it was good and solid and it seemed to be solid. Up at the speaker relay it looked, you know, we've got like 20-25 millivolts which is much more like it and I'm sure I'll be able to adjust that right down to zero. I was glad to see uh, she was ready to go. As I just showed you in this video of this 2245, it was one of the power amplifier assemblies and the protection assembly was actually working properly. It was doing its job to protect your speakers. But sometimes it is the protection assembly itself. But many times it is one of the power amplifiers that are causing an issue. I thought that was a good video to show you. That's a typical kind of problem you're going to have. And in this case, it wasn't a component. It was a solder joint. And I couldn't even tell which one. I took a close look at it with a magnifying glass. I couldn't tell. Had to hit a bunch of different leads. And sometimes that's how it is. Many times you do know what you did to fix it. 
But in instances like this, where it's intermittent like this, this type of an issue, sometimes you won't ever know really what it was. So that's a little bit of a troubleshooting section on your protection circuit with a piece of vintage audio equipment. Now I'm gonna move on to some typical issues that can be caused by the power supply section. Maybe I shouldn't say typical problems because a power supply and a piece of vintage audio gear can cause all sorts of different issues. Anything from it just looks dead in the water, you hit the power button, nothing happens, to it powers up and it could be a variety of different issues. You might have one channel out, you might have distortion. So really the best way to troubleshoot an issue with the power supply, the first thing you want to do is get your multimeter and just measure the voltages. Almost all of those schematics show you the voltages coming out of the power supplies. So if you're supposed to have 65 volts at this pin, or 25 volts at another pin, or minus 87 volts at another pin, you can look at that and make sure that's working. And that's a pretty easy check to do in most pieces of vintage audio equipment. You can take a look at that real quick and eliminate your power supply from being a problem if you're having an issue with your piece of equipment. And don't be too concerned if the voltages aren't exactly as what the schematic states they should be. But they should be close. They should be within 5 or 10%. So if you've got a 30 volt lead, you ought to have something between 27 and 33. So anywhere between there, you're probably good to go. But if you're supposed to have 30 volts on a particular lead and you've got 15 or you've got 45, you need to check that out a little bit closer. But these aren't always gonna be perfect, just like what the schematic says. So I pretty much covered the entire SX1250 the best I could by using their block diagram from the service manual. I went over the tuner section with you and how to troubleshoot an issue with your tuner. I went over the EQ amplifier section, which is the phono section, as I indicated earlier. I went over the preamplifier section, which they call the control section. I went over the power amplifier along with the protection circuit and the power supply. And again, I want to remind you guys to get the service manual from HiFiEngine.com. There's a lot of information in there. And really the thing is, it takes experience. It does take experience to work on this equipment. But obtaining that documentation that nowadays is available free up on the internet is going to really help you along to repair whatever piece of vintage audio equipment you may have. Remember, there's been hundreds of people, or even thousands of people like myself, who've worked on this equipment. Again, use the internet to find out more about your piece of equipment. If you've got a particular brand, a particular model, Google it and see what other people have done to repair their piece of equipment or to restore it, whatever it is you're trying to do. Almost every piece of equipment except the most rare pieces, other people have been there and done that. You can find out a lot about your piece of equipment and your particular issues just by doing a search out there on the internet. As you've seen in this video, Almost all the information that you need to fix 99% of your vintage audio equipment is available out on the internet. You just have to do the work to find it. It's not going to just pop up for you. It's just the way it is. Most of the time you're going to have to go out there and Google it and you're going to have to look through things, but eventually you're going to be able to find information on 99% of the audio equipment that was ever made out there. Many people have come before you, so you can usually find out what parts you need. You can find out some information about how they fixed it. The only thing that you don't get is experience, and you guys that do anything well, you know how it is. You can read a book until you go ahead and try to do something. It's not so easy to do at first, but it gets easier as time goes on. So I hope this video helped you guys out to troubleshoot your vintage audio equipment. And as I mentioned many times, this video wasn't about fixing one particular type of vintage audio equipment but just a general guide of how to approach a piece of equipment 
and how to take it step by step depending on what type of an issue that you have. And as I showed early in the video, you've got to have some basic tools to do any troubleshooting or restoration on a piece of vintage audio equipment. Depending what you're doing, you may be able to get by with just some screwdrivers and some cutters, some needle nose pliers, and a multi meter. In other cases, you're going to need more sophisticated equipment like a signal generator, and an oscilloscope and that's another thing you've got to take a look at to see what type of an issue that you have and to go ahead and proceed from there of what tools that you're going to also need to help you troubleshoot an issue but I would say three quarters of the problems that you're going to run into if you've just got a good digital multi meter and some basic hand tools you'll be able to fix a lot of different issues with vintage audio equipment if you enjoyed this video I'd appreciate a thumbs up down below for you non subscribers I'd really appreciate a subscription and for my present subscribers as always thank you so much y'all have a good day